we've kind of lost touch with the true meaning of Christmas. I mean, that, that's true in 2023. That was true when they made uh, the episodes of Charlie Brown, where he says, can someone tell me what Christmas is all about? It's not about Santa. It is about the birth of Jesus Christ. And why does that matter? That matters because we all need a savior to save us from our sins. And uh, the modern world doesn't understand that, but we here in the body of Christ, we understand that all too clearly, that we need a savior to change us from within and to make us into new people. So, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just pray you minister to us right now, God, through this message about Christmas and why it matters. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. When she was just a young woman, when she heard uh, from God that she would give birth to the Son of God. Can you imagine how she felt as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old uh, being told, you're going you're gonna to give birth to the Son of God. No pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure. So Mary, I'm sure, is feeling overwhelmed, stressed out, trying to figure out, how is this, this going to affect my life? How is my life going to be different now? And obviously it's going to be very different. But she knew she needed, uh, she trusted God, but she needed some advice. So Mary actually takes a long trip to visit her cousin named Elizabeth. She visits her cousin, Elizabeth. So all of this is, is happening, and she's making this long journey to uh, her cousin, Elizabeth, who's an old woman by now. Her cousin is much older. Her cousin is 88 years old. But all this took place at about 35 to 40 B.C., and this is during the time of the reign of Augustus, who was Caesar of the ancient Roman Empire during this time in history. Following Augustus would be Tiberius. And we'll see later that Augustus would order a census taken of the Roman Empire, which would include Israel. And do you see how this biblical account here, though, reads like history? It doesn't read like a myth or a fantasy. It reads like recorded history. It's talking about a Roman Empire that we know really existed. Okay? So, many of them wondered, well, was there ever really an Augustus Caesar that was mentioned in the Bible? Did this person really exist as, an, as a Caesar, as an emperor of Rome? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, in fact, they found a bust, a, uh, a statue of Augustus Caesar was discovered, a large statue, by divers in the Aegean Sea. And this is what you call archaeological evidence for the Bible. That they found that this, this emperor talked about in the Bible really existed. In fact, they found a statue of him. In fact, that there's over 120 examples of Augustus Caesar in world museums today saying this guy really existed. But what about Jesus himself, you might ask? Did he really exist? For us Christians, we know that, but you can look at Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, an ancient historian, and he was his, his accounts are very well trusted and in 112 AD, Tacitus wrote this regarding the reign of Nero and Nero's response to the great fire of Rome. This is what Tacitus wrote about Jesus. And this is recorded outside the Bible. He wrote this, quote, Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. So Tacitus records that Nero blamed the fire, great fire of Rome on the Christians. And he started persecuting them and throwing them to the lions. He says, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius uh, at the hands of one of our procur procurators, Pontius Pilate. Tacitus records all that 
outside the Bible. Okay? All of this to indicate, once again, in our Case for Christmas series, we are seeing facts outside the Bible that line up with what the Bible says. So when some jerk tells you the Bible's just a book of myths, you can say that's not true. I know that history and archaeology lines up with the Bible. Because there are people out there who think, oh, it's just a book of myths, blah, blah, blah. It's history. It all lines up. Archaeology, history, biblical manuscripts. Jesus mentioned outside the Bible. Some people are actually dumb enough to think that Jesus never existed. It's mentioned right here by a historian, Tacitus, who lived at the same time. Right there. What do you do with that? It's like, oh, Jesus never existed. It's right there. I'm not even talking about the Bible. I'm talking outside the Bible by a historian. What do you do with that? I don't know. Start getting real nervous if you're an atheist. Despite all the hot air out there, we can trust the biblical documents and the accounts of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we open up our Bible to Luke chapter 1, and we start to read down the pages, we must remember that we're reading accurate history, not fables or myths. These things really happened. So Mary, this 16-year-old peasant girl, has been given news that's going to change her life forever. And she takes this eight-plus-mile journey to Enon Karim, a city in Israel, to visit Elizabeth. It's 80 miles as the crow flies. I'm sorry, yeah. 80 mile, not eight mile, 80 mile as the crow flies. But to make the journey means crossing several mountain stretches. It's a dangerous journey, but she decides that she must make it. She arrives to see Elizabeth and spends over three months with her. That is an exceedingly long sleepover, if you ask me. Three months. But most definitely a valuable moment. Because sometimes when your life is going crazy and you don't know what's going on, you got to get together with a, a good friend and talk it over. you got to sit down with a friend and say, I need your advice, I need your help, what do I do next? Mary and Elizabeth don't know it at the time, but God is literally going to change the world through the two children growing in their valleys. Because Elizabeth, when Mary gets there, she finds that Elizabeth is pregnant. She is pregnant with John the Baptist. And Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And these two are going to be a dynamic duo that will bring forth the kingdom of God. Isn't it amazing, though, for women? Women get to carry a baby within them. Get to, get to give birth to a child. What a great blessing it is, then, to be a mother and how important that is. I think of Susanna Wesley, the, what you might call the mother of Methodism, because she trained up John and Charles Wesley to be godly men. And then John and Charles would lead one of the greatest revivals in the history of the church in, in England, all through a mother who cared about raising her children to know God. Imagine if every mother trained their children to know Jesus Christ. You know? So Elizabeth would give birth to John the Baptist. Does anyone here think John the Baptist is really awesome? I love John the Baptist. He is really cool. He is a weirdo. He's a little different. He, he eats bugs, and he eats honey, and he lives in the wilderness, and he proclaims the coming of the kingdom of God. That is awesome. He proclaims the coming of the Messiah. And then we have Jesus, unborn baby in Mary's belly. They both needed each other at this moment in their lives. They were about to literally give birth to two people who would transform the world for generations to come. Everything would change. What do you do when something really crazy is happening in your life? 
You come to a friend for encouragement. That's why this message fits so well for this moment in time. It's Christmas time. We're rushing here and there, trying to get everything taken care of, right? We do that a lot in society. Run like mad, trying to get everything done. Marking off the to-do list, check by check. It's Christmas time and we're rushing here and there. Running like mad, trying to get everything done. Marking off the to-do list, check by check. One of the best things I can try to do is slow down and regain some composure and sanity in my life and to spend time with family. That's why right after Christmas, I go and spend a week with family. It's very important. Something about family can really help straighten out the priorities in our lives, don't you think? Mary understood that when she made the nine-day journey to Elizabeth's home. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that our Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Elizabeth was an instant encouragement to Mary. Mary didn't understand what was happening in her life. She knew the Lord was with her, and she knew her son would be the savior of the world. But she was probably wondering, is anyone else going to believe this? It must have been a great relief when Elizabeth, her dear friend, believed her, encouraged her, and invoked the name of the Lord. Let me encourage you today. God is at work in your life. And I hope you'll stay positive today. I want to encourage you to stand firm in your faith. Jesus Christ is on the throne. He is the King of Kings. And every day you live for him means eternal treasures waiting for you in heaven. Just like Mary, maybe we intellectually understand the promises of God, but she may not be feeling it. She may be feeling uncertain. She may be feeling overwhelmed, like... Lord, how am I ever going to handle what's happening in my life? I feel that way about where I'm at sometimes. Lord, I can't handle this. It's all too much. You ever feel that way? Yeah. I remember a long time ago when I was just starting my journey as a Christian, God had challenged me in my devotional life. And one night I, was, I felt like he was saying to me, Justin, you can't worry about tomorrow today. You won't have the strength. And remember that if you remain always the way you are today, it would be too much for you. But I want you to trust me that I will craft and shape you into a man who is able to joyfully complete the calling I've placed on your heart. Essentially, God was telling me to trust in his future grace. Mary received that kind of encouragement through Elizabeth, who affirmed her that she had been correct to believe the Lord that she would truly give birth to Jesus. She went to Elizabeth to receive, not necessarily a gift from Elizabeth, though it was transmitted through Elizabeth. Really what Mary found when she went to Elizabeth was another blessing from God. First, she received the blessing of bearing the Son of God. Second, she received encouragement from God through her friend along the way. God gives us a calling, each of us, yet he also gives us encouragement along the way. Final point today, how can you be an encouragement to someone this Christmas season? That's what I want to challenge you to do today. Be an encouragement to someone. Help someone who's in need this Christmas. Just maybe give an encouraging word to someone. Okay? Just a, just a word. Someone will be having a bad day and they need to hear something from you. <clears throat> then maybe you can join Mary in this proclamation when she said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name.